why did I settle on the rule of blame? I refused the rule of blame, so never considered the negative aspects of God before. I did the Antichrist, after all, in my opinion, no one would care if Christ lived or died without his teachings. Yet we insist on labeling him God on earth, which makes glorifying his pain as something to be proud of instead of ashamed of. You can pretend by doing the Holy Trinity argument if you want, but the argument is Christ is fundamentally God. And that led me to consider God versus the devil and the oddity that God has an equal. This is completely at odds with everything I've ever been taught, yet I never questioned the insanity of this argument. Next was a mirror of a phrase spoken of during a play called Laramie Project. The story of Matthew Shepard, who died in 1998 for the sin of being gay. We heard the cry, oh, we don't teach hate. And this was from everyone close to those two insisting that they don't teach hate in Laramie, Wyoming. One of them was a church pastor who said this. It was a phrase that echoed in my mind for decades until I finally considered the reality we all teach hate. Not in words exactly, or maybe I should say we fail to realize those words spoken by adults that would never go beyond the petty words they've said are heard of by the children they are raising. Children whose moral code is just beginning to develop, and since we usually tell them to not think and just do as we tell them, is it any wonder they will do things we would not? Add to this mind-altering substances, and I could imagine they do what adults would not. Just taking it to the next level and perfecting what they've been told. All three religions insist they have the word of God in a book. This means if you believe in what you're told, anyone that dares to own God's gift of free will must be evil. Therefore, I dislike the insistence that Christ must be God. And that led to the creation of the Holy Ghost to make sense of a basically insane notion. Every time children do something, parents come out, throw their kids under the bus by insisting uh, they were shocked the child would do such a thing. However, I do believe the adults honestly believe uh, they would not do what their child did. This reminded me of all the times I felt unsettled when sitting next to a person and watching the same event. Uh, they did, but when we talked about it, they had heard something I didn't. I kept feeling insane since I clearly heard what was said, yet not what they heard. Having creativity, you must necessarily consider you could be wrong. Now, these people showed no doubts. What they heard was true, increasing my own doubts. My mind was clear. Something I often find irritating is I rarely forget things. Numbers have always come easy for me, even though I really detest accounting. I'd remember every inconsistent comment and call people out. Obviously, this made me less than welcome among certain people. There is only a one answer that was possible. God doesn't have an equal. And the cry we hear often, why does God let bad things happen? Has only one purpose. He doesn't, and he never did. Humanity can have an equal. Evil is not the creation of God. It's to hide the soul from us, so we can do what we want. If God is infallible and we can't be blamed, and then the mind must provide an answer. So, the soul and mind, together, comes up with one. It was the moment God became a hidden God, hidden behind the illusion of evil. If you listen to everyone around you, they will insist God can't go to hell. When you die, God would abandon his creation to some dark, dangerous place, so it could be punished for eternity but it's not got an equal. What society needs is conformity. We want assurance. We're going to die. We want to know what that's going to be. 
we understand only one certain thing. We will die. How many have been broken attempting to gain the acceptance of the last generation, especially those that embrace a book they claim is the word of God? Point out the inconsistencies in the book. Uh, between other passages, they get angry. I went to a church bringing the King James Version of the Bible, open to find spirituality to heal what was in my head. I was told by the pastor that that book would not be appropriate since they used the new international version of the Bible and I wouldn't be able to follow along if I read from the book. The Word of God has two interpretations? <sighs> Sorry, I might consider translation as necessary and that would change some words, but once something is translated into that language and you insist it is the word of God, then you can't honor God insisting I follow a book that you claim the right to change when you please. That's why I started my work on the Coburn Bible. I intended to attack the insane ideal that a book written by many people must be inspired by God and every last one of those people. Too many had been broken because of arrogant people insisting they have a right to do what every book of scripture has always told us God tells us not to do judge others. I didn't want to do this with the other books for one simple reason. They had their beliefs and I'd not yet developed mine. I needed to be able to defend my argument. Unlike the three religions, this book doesn't have rabid followers and unlike the three books, this one does not claim God is a punishing God. I read it once for my use. The second time to record the book and honoring the words by taping them by verse I learned far more than I could have imagined. Book six, Morals and Precepts, solidified so much. And the first time I read it, I thought it was the most useless part of the Egyptian text. I was so wrong, and I'd never have gained what I did just reading this book as a book. As it so often has turned out to be. In my insistence not to damage what I love... What I thought had value, I was given a bounty beyond anything I could have imagined. Clearly the cry, why does God let bad things happen, is a way to avoid looking at ourselves as the guilty party. Next I considered World War II, the ability to dehumanize people to the point you can do awful things to other people that have a soul. The most sickening words ever uttered by leaders is the phrase, never again when it always happens again. And the last time I heard those words was in Sudan, spoken by my own president. As someone who was leading at a time, this genocide was happening. We knew of the rumors, just as we knew of World War II atrocities. But, as usual, the argument was, we didn't know, and who are we to judge? Except we judge everyone daily. I was damaged by many that judge only on looks and actions. How dare people look the other way when it's inconvenient embracing an argument that we shouldn't act because it doesn't involve us. We should have doubt and avoid the danger of letting ourselves do selfish things under the delusion we are doing the right thing. But history can teach human behavior. It doesn't repeat human behavior. We'll always repeat. I started doing videos and I coined my phrase, the first one, Recovering Narcissist. Mostly it was dealing with countries and especially the West that always insist they learn their lesson and then fail to understand having damaged these people using the argument for the greater good, we must help these poor people. Those that today insist they learn their lesson interfere again and always use the argument since we sacrificed our soldiers. It gives us a right to insist they embrace our beliefs. After all, ours are far more superior. We're only helping them to jump up to our level. Have you ever told a child you're doing it for their own good, or anyone ever tell you this? Did you respond well? That is the exact argument used by the most arrogant people from our own past that we now disown. We find distasteful. Clearly, God doesn't let bad things happen, but 
humanity having free will has. But why? It took a while, but all this did fit. I couldn't come up with a way to explain it until one day it just popped out. A language of perception. And that was two years ago, and I've come so far. The videos I'm uploading today from the Coburn Bible are the same ones that I was working on when all this stuff occurred to me. It was around chapter 30 of the book 6, Morals and Precepts. The comments have already been made for the rest of this book. It's odd that much of what I'm touching on in the Trinity Knot is so developed, and I must wonder how consistent those comments I made back then are to my work today. I could listen, but I prefer to trust that they are. I spoke from the heart, and while some might see a discrepancy, I'm convinced I can defend my opinions made almost a year ago. Even with the reality, my views have been changed by all this work I'm doing today. Every single comment was attached with phrases in the Coburn Bible, and it was those words that provided the structure for every comment. Nothing I've said could possibly be off because everything was thought of, and weighed with the knowledge I would be owning these comments. Blame is the one thing that I removed if I ever embraced it, and I'm unsure that I did. The only time I could have would have been around age of nine years old, before I was traumatized so severely for my creativity being so present. It strengthened me, something I find so irritating about the mental health profession today, the insistence on highlighting the good, which also highlights that there's a bad. So many insist when I'm talking about that time I'm living in the past. This is a shock to me because I'm not angry or blaming anyone for my actions. I'm not living in it. I'm owning it. I see how far I came and that was where I started from. To hide it would be insane. It would make me be able to do awful things to other people. To hate people that had such an impact on my life would be to admit I hate something about myself. And I'm proud of all I've overcome. I might not be perfect, but I certainly have come a long way. I will not disown what created me, and I do not see the past as good or bad. Too many would hide from their mistakes or blame those in the past for what was done to them, and they wallow in it. And I did for a long time. I am a stubborn person. I can't tell you how many times I've had someone angry at me by pointing out I'm making sure they have at least what I had during the worst of times. They attack by saying they don't care how bad I had it. This shocks me to think anyone would assume that I considered those times as bad. I had little, but I always had enough to get through, and that is all anyone can hope for. So why would you not be proud that you survived that? We clearly embrace blame. Even those that follow religion have embraced it by creating an equal to God. Tell them they will insist uh, this isn't so. That's an insane way to think, but that's what they do. They just can't consider if God has no equal, then oh, why can't he go to retrieve what he created? They say this makes sense, but they can't explain it. He must be the only person that has no limits to his abilities, yet we force him to have limits to avoid the reality. If he didn't do anything wrong, we must have. It sucks to have no excuse, but worse to create a fake one that damages the person who never damaged us. So many of his creations have been damaged by this rule we all embrace. Women were left the original sin. And I must ask, how many disposable souls did God put on this earth so men can plant their seeds? At my count, there are at least three different types of souls assigned to women alone. And that's not even counting the subcategories of men that don't fit your ideal, that is shaped by a book, that you insist is God's word until you change it. And then that will be his words. 
Anyone that says they believe in only one God can't ignore that every human on earth has a soul. And yet we do. Only one explanation exists for this in my view. The mind must have structure. And if creativity is disappearing, it must be because mind is compensating for the chaos. And in doing this, funneling only what the soul has told it. Then is it any wonder that over time we become what we hate? Those boundaries are meant to allow possibilities, but at some point, chaos changes its flow. Instead of the boundaries keeping chaos from overwhelming a society, it is now the source of chaos into other societies. That is the result of arrogant ignorance, something recovering narcissists rely on often. And always it's from the self-deception. All we are doing is for your own good. Well, God doesn't have an equal... That isn't true for the soul, and equal with knowledge of our strengths and weaknesses. The mind, an aspect that was never to be evil. In fact, it is only serving us under the constraints we placed on it, with the rule of blame. A look at the attributes we give to God's equal. It is the mind, a soulless creation that will manipulate and speak often of sacrifice for the greater good. One can't manipulate without the mind to offer examples of the past. It serves the soul's aspect. And how many spouses have been damaged by physical and verbal abuse? Those damaged have done things they hate, but believing themselves worthless does as they are told. Sadly, the mind is only doing its job, allowing us to damage ourselves because of the rule of blame which stops it from being the nurturing aspect it was meant to be all along. In embracing the rule of blame you must convince yourself it makes sense. There can be no doubt in the mind or the body or the soul. Only the mind can offer that certainty only because it doesn't offer all the possibilities, just a negative or a positive, which is all the learned behavior rule of blame will allow. It is supposed to offer possibilities, all of the possibilities, so that the creative aspect can make a wise and complete decision. Only a rule placed by a selfish aspect, and creativity is selfish, Having unlimited potential and told to restrain itself, it will grow arrogant without consequences to its actions. Something too many parents refuse to teach because they believe it is not compassionate. Failing to realize in denying God the ability to teach a lesson, you can only destroy what he entrusted to you. A rule of blame placed in the mind puts a straitjacket on what it can offer. This allows us to ignore that of those that would deny us our free will is human because they worship evil. When in fact uh, they would deny your desire to do what you want, that's not evil. That would make you evil, at least in their eyes, if you have the will and you don't care who you damage. Free will is the moment that the creative aspect overrules the mind based on what it knows must be done, according to what the mind tells it. The creative aspect is always going to be the start of a cycle, while the other side will be forced to react. The oddity is, each cycle, government will always be the source of pain and suffering, while it's the creative aspect that has the less learned behavior rules that must react. This leads to the mirror aspect I talk about. It's what often makes us a give up trying to make sense of all this. Only embracing God's lesson of cause and effect will teach humility. Force the creative aspect to do what it doesn't want to. The first thing it must do is earn back the one it first damaged. The mind. Its partner that it muzzled so long ago. You must learn its language. Walk its path by creating these structures that it had to when you impose this on your human trinity. 
The human trinity represents a way to fulfill the body's assigned duties of filtering chaos. While the spectrums is necessary to create the structure, the mind needs to handle the chaos created by possibilities. I finally have an answer for why my creativity has an affinity for numbers. It's only recently I found this out. We are perceived as one. And that is, in fact, one plus one. The spirit and the body. That creates three. Now, when we embrace the rule of blame, we force the mind to compensate by creating an illusion, trinity, to compensate for the soul's unintended consequences of placing that rule. So what was two went to four, which means there is now three human trinities, but the soul is missing, hidden. So there has to be an illusionary aspect to the mind's trinity. It must have a seat for the soul that will explain who it's talking about. So at first it would be the heart, since feelings can be told by the mind. As you gain knowledge, it became the brain. We we're able to look at the brain, touch it, so we know that exists. But the mind aspect is just as transitory as the soul. So, for one trinity, we have two. That's a total of six aspects that are, in fact, eight. Because a body now has three that was not supposed to be. There is more to this, but I just thought I'd point out how math has finally come into play in understanding this mess. I will only say that the trinities of every three decades will find parity at the completion of a cycle. Six decades equals ten generations. That is another aspect I mentioned in another video. It's developing and likely will not be completed in the first book I release. But cause represents the first generation, while the 11th is the effect lesson. It's telling you that that 11th generation has a chance of learning from the imaginary 5th generation that goes from one cycle to the other. So we now have 12. The more I explore based on the rule of blame, the more I'm understanding the cycles. And therefore, I label these videos the Trinity Knot. Believe they are warnings as well as a guide to avoid rigidity while raising the young. It takes three successful attempts to place learned behavior rules. That must not be allowed to happen, not in an adult or in a child. Humility is the key. And understand, when I speak of humility, I'm talking of humble, not humiliation. There is a difference. I can assure you, if you refuse to hurt others to get what you desperately want, you might not get everything, but you will get what you need and usually keep the insanity from infecting you. Let the arrogant have their day. They live in a cell, not realizing they have the key. I could imagine nothing more humbling than a granting them their wish to be left with their body. If they can't touch it, feel it, in some way experience it with the body, they just will not accept that it exists. That would be the rigid aspect in both sides. As we age, creativity disappears with rigidity. Of those that have sacrificed all to conform with society has paid a heavy price. They deserve pity, not hate. They are in a prison of their own making, holding the key in their hand, but waiting for the warden to bring them possibilities. They are far more disabled than me. I am at peace with my trinity, and enjoy the ability to make these leaps. If God can teach through consequences... He can overcome the failing grade of the last generation. He will teach it, even if he must wait till the day that the cost is so great 
humility washes in like a tidal wave. It always has, and always will. Only arrogant adults would do what God would not. <laughs>